Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Doi Ardeni. I'm the head of incident response and hunting at Otorio. I've previously served as a third team leader in the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. I've, um, I managed threat hunting operations and also dealt with targeted cyber threats on big organizations. Um, I also bring uh, hacking knowledge uh, from my experience as a red team researcher. So I hope you will enjoy this session. The material effort together with OSI Soft and Mike was really cool. Thanks, Dor. And this is Mike Lemley. I work at OSI Soft. We were in response to the wonderful research that Dor presented to us on the vulnerability they discovered in our product. Um, I've been at OSI Soft since 1999. I focused primarily in software development. And then about seven years, I started focusing on cybersecurity and now work as part of our central architecture team uh, and hoping to improve uh, the cybersecurity practices of our development at OSI Soft. Thanks, Mike. So let's start with a quick story and at the end of it, we'll get to my point. So two weeks ago, a ship leader at a chemical plant received an alert from the data management platform, platform like the one of OSI, so PyServer. The, the alert reported about a boiler that exceeded from its threshold temperature. The shift leader was really nervous. And it, in addition to that, databases of all historical plant data and their backups were deleted, which means they had no access to industry 4.0 analytics, like people like to say. The plant was shut down due to this abnormal activity. The concern was physical damage and human loss. The shutdown caused a loss of significant production time, which means a lot of money. So why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this because it's not a nightmare. It's not a fairy, fairy tale story. When you base your decisions on the data management platform, especially while it's been manipulated, you are technically blind. You are blind from your operational environment. So we have two core goals that we want to achieve from this session. The first one is to raise awareness about the implications of industrial rented vulnerability, where each vulnerability is a serious threat to our sensitive environment and it's not only uh, ICS vulnerability, it could be also IT vulnerabilities that somehow affect directly on our production flow. That the second goal is to showcase how the discovery of one vulnerability can help other vendors. Mike will talk about the way things proceeded after we identified uh, the vulnerability in their product. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Pi system is from OSI Soft. We start off with our core customers. So these six areas of business um, are where most of our customers um, industry. And <clears throat> the company OSI Soft has been around for about 40 years. So we have customers in 140 different countries. And this world map gives you an indication of where we have support offices to help our customers. This reference architecture explains how a lot of our Now, what we want is we want to reduce the amount of people that have access within the critical system. And the OSI Soft Pi system infrastructure allows them to do that by pulling the data that is needed for analysis and, and business decisions out of the critical system so that those people don't need to have access there so they can in order to do their job. Next. This additional data reference, arch or reference architecture also represents how the Pi system is used. Now the, the, the Pi server inside of the control center is used to extract the data from the control center using hundreds of different protocols based on the different types of equipment there. 
data is then sent over to the corporate access or corporate network zone, where it is then used by those employees in order to do their analysis. Now the target for this particular incident is within the vision server. And that is where the API, the API server exists that is being used um, and attacked by this particular incident, which is a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Next, please. Okay, so before I deep dive into the details of the vulnerability, suppose you ask yourself why we even started looking at PyServer. And the answer is that we had to put some effort uh, into product tasks. We had to integrate uh, OSI soft platform, the Pi server, into our, into our security orchestration and response platform. But as a curious researcher, I decided to test the asset framework of the Pi server um, on XSS. Um, it was very late at night, so realistic as it sounds. I thought again the web API parsing mechanism uh, to, in order to inject JavaScript code into client browsers. And at the end, I succeeded, and we are here. So here is a screenshot from the asset framework. On the left, we have a simple plant, a Toyo plant with boiler and tank. Uh, each element uh, has attributes. For example, the boiler has attribute of temperature, and the tank has an attribute of uh, volume and element one is the child element only for my tests. On the right, you can see uh, the description field, the vulnerable field, uh, with encoded base64 JavaScript. Um, in order to bypass the, uh, the web API parsing, me parsing mechanism, uh, you have to insert some magic characters at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of it once once an attacker managed to do so he can he or she can run a javascript code on client browser for uh, phishing uh, keylogin etc okay so here is a possible scenario for this attack first an attacker uh, is stealing uh, low privileges credentials inside the network. After that, the attacker is injecting the malicious, malicious JavaScript to the uh, vulnerable field that we saw in the previous slide. Then uh, a victim, for example, an innocent engineer, is accessing the web infected page. And then a fake logging form is prompting for uh, username and password, and also in parallel, changing the notification rule template on behalf of the engineer high privileges credentials. At the end of it, the attacker receiving the victim credentials and also causing temple to false positive alerts. Okay, so let's see it, see it in action. On the right, is the server of the attacker. Listen on port 8080 for the stolen credentials. On the left, the, the, victim, the victim browser. Once the victim passes the cursor over the infected field, the description field, the fake login form is prompting for username and password. The victim is inserting the PI admin password. And once the victim submits the credentials, the attacker get the stolen credentials on the right. PI admin and the strong password. So from here, it's pretty much game over. And, and in the same method, in the same technique, 
I could also add a JavaScript code to change the notification rule template in order to um, to change uh, to, to change the rule and to cause false positive alert uh, of high temperature. Okay, so so this screenshot was taken from US third side. The vulnerability has got rank of 7.7. .7. OSI soft also added us in their all of thanks list. Here in the bottom, Dorya Dani and Eliad Mualem. And I suppose you ask yourself how to avoid this kind of attacks. So the answer is patching. OSI soft released, released a patch for the vulnerability very, very quickly, but we have to do a lot more, a lot more proactive actions, such as red hunting operations on our sensitive environment to harden firewall rules, and also to get visibility into our uh, uh, assets and their version in order to, uh, in order to perform vulnerability uh, management, um, etc. But that's, that's for another talk. Yeah, I'll talk about the lessons that OSISoft learned from this incident and um, how we responded. Now, to start off with, I'm going to talk a little bit about our security development lifecycle process at OSISoft, um, and that'll define how we change, we responded. So we at OSISoft establish several different security best practices, and then we, we do is we measure the adoption by our um, 40 around 40 development teams uh, to apply those security best practices in, in their development. Now, why do we measure? Um, <clears throat> I, I constantly say, I mean, what good are best practices if you don't measure to see how well you are adopting them? But <clears throat> in addition to that, it really helps teams plan. Uh, when you go through the process of identifying measurements for the best practices, it forces you to identify milestones. And those milestones are very useful for the teams to, to plan against and, and plan their, their development activities. And the other thing that it does is it forces you to organize and prioritize all these best practices. And that also helps uh, the teams identify how to best move forward. Now, looking at our SDL process, focused entirely on cross-site scripting, that allowed us to see where we could improve our process. So we have education um, uh, of um, defensive programming. We also have various tools that we use um, and the vendors which um, that we use for these various tools are listed on the right side along with some of the security researchers we engage with. So as I said, we have various security tools we use. Uh, there's static analysis, <clears throat> software component analysis, which actually helps us find cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in components that we consume, you know, open source products. Uh, we have the, um, various security headers that we um, encourage use of, uh, as well as the external reviews and incident response, which was very key in how we handled this issue that, that came to us from Otario. Now, in looking at those processes, we defined there were some areas we thought we could improve or add on to. So the first one is um, an internal security uh, tech talk. We do tech talks weekly at OSIsoft. Every third week, they are focused on security. And we did a tech talk specifically on this incident so we could share the lessons learned from this with the other of the 40 teams at OSIsoft. We also looked at how we use the static application security testing tool and identified some process improvements for our use of that tool. And the last is we decided to get much more aggressive on the adoption of content security policy at OSISoft. Now, I did say that we do measure um, <clears throat> our best practices, and I just wanted to give you a sense of what some of the measurements are that we use associated with just our cross-site scripting defenses in OSISoft in the best practice areas I, I defined. Next one. Now, <clears throat> we didn't do any process improvements on our DAST tool, and I'm gonna talk briefly about that. Now, the DAST tool that we use is from Qualys, and 
for those of you who don't remember what a DAS tool is, it's basically, it's run as a start, your, your application um, is up and running and then the, the, the DAS tool will send dynamic tests at your web server, typically OWASP top 10 um, attacks and see whether or not your web server has the appropriate implementations in place to protect against it. Now, in this particular cross-site scripting issue, as Dora explained, it was a, a stored cross-site scripting attack. But in looking at the tools, it's more of a DOM cross-site scripting vulnerability with use of uh, insecure use of inner HTML. Now, our DAS tool, Qualys, is very good when the source of the inner HTML parsing the, the bad package is from a document URL, cookies or referrer header, but it doesn't really handle well when the source is from an HTML document. So we decided not to focus there. Next. Now our static, static application security testing tool is from Synopsys. And if you look at the bottom right as a reminder for what SAS tools do, they analyze your code. So they're looking directly at your code, look at call stacks, how functions are reached, and identify insecure call paths or insecure, um, insecure uh, calling sequences. <clears throat> so we felt that was the best tool. It should identify where inner HTML is used and, then, and should be able to flag insecure uses of it. So what went wrong with this? Um, we identified that there was a tool compatibility problem with the, with the NuGet package that we used. Um, it's a Razor engine, <clears throat> um, and uh, our tool synopsis did not work well with it. It does work very well with the Razor analysis built into ASP.NET. Um, so consequent to this problem, our scanning for this particular project missed all JavaScript and CSH GML. So the process improvements we identified is we need to be able to do some central evaluation of the SAS configurations. Um, and we're working with Synopsys on how to best move that idea forward. The other thing we're going to do is for this one particular development team, we're going to move them um, to using the ASP.NET MVC Razor engine instead. And then we're also considering um, increasing the sensitivity to completely disallow the use of inner HTML. We're not sure exactly how this is going to play out. Uh, but inner HTML is, is definitely not something we want to use. So we're either going to be heavily scrutinizing the use of inner HTML or completely disallow it. So we're still working that one out. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to switch context and talk a little bit about content security policy. And just to give you a why behind that, I'm focusing on jQuery. Now over the last couple of years, jQuery has released several different um, vulnerabilities. Um, <clears throat> these all, all in this chart are the cross-site scripting vulnerability. And as you can see with the overlay that was just added, they all fall in the high range for CVSS scoring, which means you have to take these particular vulnerabilities very seriously. Uh, and cross-site scripting in general does tend to fall into the high vulnerability um, area. And, and dealing with all of these different um, <clears throat> patch updates from this open source, does present challenges to vendors which consume um, open source and components for, um, under the scrutiny of, of security research. Next, please. Now, content security policy, just to explain how it works. The web server will send down HTML and JavaScript content to your browser, and now your browser is theoretically susceptible to some sort of, of, of JavaScript injection. Um, via uh, uh, a cross-site scripting payload, which has been architected by the, the attacker. Now, by adding content security policy from the same web server, you can now inform the browser of the allowed list, where JavaScript is allowed to come from. So now the browser has the ability to identify that, hey, this cross-site scripting payload is not on my allowed list. I'm not going to allow it to execute. And I also added the CDN, Content Delivery Network. So just to let you know that the content security policies allow list does incorporate more than just the web server that it came from. So there's, there's lots of flexibility there. Next slide, please. Now, we strongly believe that content security policy uh, has reached the point where it is extremely, 
extremely mature. Um, the major browsers all have implementations for it. So we, we think that um, the, the industry is in a good place where we can start um, demanding the use of content security policy and the products that we consume. Um, now a question I often get on um, Viewback, i.e. Internet Explorer, um, can you go back one door, I'm sorry. The, the Internet Explorer, I just want to talk about that one briefly. It's Internet Explorer, I, I get this question a lot. You know, it, it doesn't support a content security policy. Is that a problem? And this will not stop Internet Explorer from working. Um, so you don't have to tell customers they can't use Internet Explorer anymore. But what we, what we are taking the position of is, is that we want to inform our customers that you should be using modern browsers for their security benefit. One issue and one protection is content security policy. Next slide, please. Now, I talked about having measurements for our, our best practices. And this is the way, one of the ways that we do it. We've identified poor, better, and best practices for our development teams and came up with ways for them to measure their adoption against that. So the poor practice would be using unsafe inline and unsafe eval. Um, the next better practice would be if you do have inline JavaScript to provide nonces or hashes for it. But the best practice is, is to remove all the, those inline JavaScript and eval statements and report any failure, give the browser an endpoint to report any, any um, occurrences of defenses or blocks that it had to execute to a central reporting uh, location so that those issues can be investigated and And just to give you a general sense of how we do this measurement uh, within OSIsoft, all the measurements we've identified from the best practices um, have response options. They're all given scores. So you, you get a score, a scale from zero to 10 for all of them. And they can all be combined and you can look at collectively how teams are doing it in response to adoption of these best practices. But in addition to this, we decided to not only um, revamp um, the responses in order to um, encourage better adoption. But we decided also to take the step of making this required uh, for uh, releases going out by the end of this year. Next slide, please. Now, focusing on the key takeaways, the things that, that, that I covered, the, the, the first one was security tools. Using security tools is not enough. You really have to evaluate how you're using them, in our case, um, for better code coverage. Um, <clears throat> the next one is content security policy. We believe the industry um, is, is mature enough that content security policy is in a place that um, this should become an, an ICS standard practice, we believe. Um, it gives you a strong second level of defense. Like with a lot of open source um, components out there, I mean, most of us consume open source. And when the vulnerabilities are discovered in those open source, we just the public disclosure happens to the public at the same time it happens to us. We know about the vulnerability at the same time everyone else does. So there is limited time that we have to, to patch and, and get the protections in place. But by having that second level of defense, content security policy there, it gives us more time to get the, the, the patches in place correctly. And, and the last thing, engaging with companies like Atario and Door um, is very, very successful in moving uh, security forward for our products. And um, it's been a great experience working with them for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. The mutual effort was really cool and we very enjoyed this, uh, this research.